Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everybody here today. Uh, for those uh, coming in, this is a, a wonderful event that we have uh, with us. So first off, as we begin, uh, so this is the uh, second in the Honors Program's uh, Brown Bag Lunch series. Uh, we want to, of course, say thank you to uh, Dr. Kiana Battle in the Liberal Arts Department. We want to say thank you to Dr. Alicia Toso uh, and the Honors Program. We want to say thank you to Amy Piatkowitz uh, for all of her work with, with these. Uh, we want to say thank you to Dr. Troy Swanson uh, and all who are involved in putting this together. Uh, our speaker today is Kip Kozad. Kip Kozad served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Yemen from 1988 to 1990. Kip holds a master's in history from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where he focused on Middle East studies and completed his thesis on historical Yemeni mobility. Kip is the manager of the tutoring center and teaches as an adjunct uh, in history at Moraine Valley Community College. Join me in welcoming Kip Kozad. All right, well, thank you so much. And first, I want to say Ramadan Mubarak for the, all those that are practicing. I hope it's a meaningful Ramadan thus far. What are you, about a third of the way through Ramadan right now, roughly? You probably don't keep track, do you, at this point? Um, but uh, thank you so much for showing up. And um, as Professor, Professor Fulton mentioned, that um, I actually spent two years in Yemen, and not just like in the capital. I was in a small village where I taught English for two years. Um, for those that know anything about Yemeni geography, I was just outside of Ib in a small, in a relatively small village. And so today I get to talk about something that is my passion, and that is Yemen. And what was interesting about my time in Yemen is that it was the first country that I'd ever traveled to outside of the United States. And it wasn't like I was going for a week or two, I was going for two years. And it was uh, pure chance that I ended up in Yemen because when you sign up for the Peace Corps, they can send you anywhere, Africa, uh, East Asia, um, all, you know, South America. And when they told me that uh, would I be interested in going to Yemen, uh, my first thought was, well, I know a couple things about Yemen. I know that it's an Islamic country. I knew that they spoke Arabic, but outside of that, I didn't know anything. And so I really, you know, the, going to Yemen was a complete education in Yemen. And it was also obviously uh, an education in all of the things that go with going to Yemen from um, not knowing any Arabic before I went there to studying it really hard when we had training and then obviously going into a village where I'd have to speak it all of the time. Um, coming from a fairly secluded um, suburb uh, north of Kansas City, I didn't know anything about Islam. And so the, obviously that was a huge um, uh, learning curve for me as I, as I went to Yemen. And obviously the culture of Yemen um, is very, very different, as you guys know, than, than the United States. And so those two years that I was there, yes, I was learning a lot. I made lots of friends. But there were still lots of gaps in my understanding of like the history of Yemen and things. So when I got back from Yemen, I kind of took it upon myself to fill in all of these gaps that I didn't understand at the time that I was in Yemen. Um, this here, this picture, as I'd mentioned to a couple people earlier, the person on the left there is me. And this is what I looked like two years after being in Yemen. And this is with some friends um, near my village, and um, we're sitting around in a, uh, in a diawan or a mufraj, a sitting area. And uh, we're doing what a lot, of the cust uh, lot, lot of the locals do in the afternoon, is we're chewing got, which is a, a, a leaf. And it's kind of interesting because the government of the United States actually encouraged us to chew got. So in essence, they were encouraging us to do drugs, right? So that's, that's us there. But it's a mild narcotic. It's like drinking like four or five cups of coffee and um, going in your mind to places that are very comforting. That's basically what, how I can best explain God. But it's very, as we know, and people that are familiar with it, it's, it's unhealthy. It's not really good for your health. I did not chew it every day, uh, once a week maybe, but there it is. So um, I titled this lecture, the, the Yemen I Know. And really, it's as I said, it's not only my experience in Yemen, but it's also uh, a lot of the things that I've learned since I've come back. So we're going to talk about the history. We're going to talk a little bit 
about the mobility of Yemenis over time, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And we'll talk about how there's really kind of two Yemens. There's a Yemen that's very isolated and uh, keep to themselves in the center part of the country, but there's also this tradition of going all over the world in Yemenis. In fact, there's a there's a famous joke that the if uh, if we could, you know if we could go to Mars, the Yemenis would be the first one to go to Mars because they tend to be everywhere in the world. So, and I'll talk why that is. How how did Yemenis get to a place? where they were very cosmopolitan and traveled all over, as we're uh, looking at our audience today. Thank you so much for coming. So um, this quote up here is straight off of a hadith. Um, if you're familiar with Islam, there's the Quran, which is the word of, of God. And then there's the hadith, which are the sayings of the prophet Muhammad. And he had a lot of respect for Yemen and Yemenis. There was a lot of contact because geographically they're close together. And in the Hadith, it says, faith comes from Yemen, divine right comes from Yemen, and from Yemen comes wisdom. And so I think that as I learned that there was a lot of wisdom in Yemen. And one thing that I, you know, when I was thinking about doing this lecture, it would have been easy for me just to talk about the current conflict that's going on, the political sides and all of that, but we get enough of that. What I wanted to do is I wanted to put a historical face on Yemen and show what a wonderful place is and maybe bring you a little bit into uh, the land of Yemen and think of the country maybe a little bit different than perhaps you see on the news or, or whatever. So let's kind of take that journey with me. So first off, where is Yemen? So those in our audience who are not real familiar with it, Yemen is in the south uh, western tip of the Arabian Peninsula. It is in Asia, so if you meet a Yemeni, they're not only Arab, um, they speak Arabic, but they're also Asian. Um, this is the uh, kind of a blown up picture of, of Yemen here. You'll notice that there's a road that goes right down this kind of the middle part of the mountains. Um, some of my fondest memories in Yemen were it was getting in a taxi cab in Sana'a, which is the capital, and taking that drive all the way to Ib, where I'd catch a four-wheel drive that would take me to my village. And those people that have been to Yemen, there's really nothing quite like a Yemeni sunset when you're driving along in a taxi and, and they're playing the oud music. It just takes you to a different place. And once in a while, when I'm feeling a little blue or you know, I may be feeling nostalgic, I kind of go back. That's one of my comfort places that I go because I have such fond memories of that. Um, a lot of stories, too, but we just don't have enough time. By the way, when we're finished, I will stick around for a while. So if anybody would like to ask any questions about my experience or maybe like to fill in some gaps, happy to stick around and talk about that. Um, so also kind of the, um, so you know the geography, the Red Sea coast uh, is to the west of Yemen. They have the Gulf of Aden and the Arabian Sea, which, which empties out into the Indian Ocean. And so strategically, it's in a very important uh, part of the world. And we'll get in more detail about that as we go along. And I call this slide a shrouded land because I mentioned that the interior of Yemen is quite secluded. If you're up in the mountains, you don't have a lot of contact with a lot of people. If you're in Aden on the coast or Hodeida or some of the areas, there's all kinds of ships that are flowing uh, back and forth. So like I said, there's kind of this idea of these two Yemens. So let's get a little bit of the history. Um, one of the cool things that we've learned in the last 20 years or, or so by using DNA is that we've learned that the first people out of Africa actually went across the Bab el Mendeb Strait and went through Yemen. So Yemen, you can't get a whole lot older than the people that reside in Yemen. Um, one, one interesting thing is I was watching a video when they were, once they'd figured out that there was this migration out of Africa through Yemen into Oman and then off into, you know, India and other places, that there was a belief that maybe they did this by boat. And so a lot of archaeologists went along the coast of, uh, like, southern Yemen and into Oman to try to figure out, uh, find artifacts of these. There had to have been, you know, tons and tons of artifacts if all these people were flowing out of Africa through this area and they didn't find any. And then they went further north, and there was a wadi, which is a wadi is a, a land feature that exists in pr predominantly in the Middle East, where when it rains, it fills up and, and it forms like a river, and when it's dry, it's just a dry riverbed. 
Well, they found this big, this long wadi, and it was filled with um, spear tips that has its origin in Africa, like hundreds of thousands of them. And it was, uh, they understood that the climate was different at that time. This whole area was actually green, and that wadi was an actual river. And so the, the people that were flowing out of that were using that body of water, that river, as a means to move along, probably planting as they go or hunting because all the animals would go there. And so they were kind of able to pinpoint the source of this migration um, out of um, Africa into uh, the Arabian Peninsula. One of the coolest things about Yemen is its ancient history. And it's something that I don't think is really talked about enough. I had a discussion this weekend with a, a friend of mine who lives in Dearborn. I was like, you know, when I was teaching in, in Yemen, I don't remember uh, the Yemenis actually having a history class just on Yemen. And he goes, no, you're right. And I'm thinking, one way that we can bring Yemen together in Yemen is for them to have a collective, have Yemenis have a collective notion of their history that goes back to these ancient times because there was, there's so much richness that goes um, to this, this period during um, you know, the time before Islam. And the, in Islam, they have this period called the Jahiliya, and the Jahiliya is the period before Islam came, which was often called the Age of Ignorance. And I think that part of the issue is you really can't look at this period as people having ignorance. Yes, they may have fo followed different gods and had different beliefs, but they had amazing technology. And Yemen was at the forefront of the technological advances, in, particularly, in particular, the controlling of water. And if you look at the map over here on the left, these are all the different kingdoms that existed. I have the dates that um, correspond to them down below. And you'll notice that the earliest one is a place called Saba. In, in, um, in English or in the West, we call it Sheba. And if you're familiar with the Bible, there's the Queen of Sheba, and that's where she resided. And Saba was one of the famous places that controlled this water. They actually had a dam. And most of these civilizations, these cities you'll notice, are kind of um, to the east. And one reason is because this area was relatively flat and it was easy to move across for trade. And so they, they resided in there, not in the mountains per se, although I'm sure there was a lot of people at this time that lived in the mountains of Yemen. But they resided in these city-states, controlling the water and engaging in uh, trade all along this kind of north-south area from the coast up to the north. And this area over to the right today would be the kind of the province of Hyderabad uh, was famous for a certain crop, a certain tree um, that produced frankincense and myrrh. And if anybody is familiar with the Christian Bible, if you remember when Jesus was born, one of the things that the three wise men gave him was frankincense and myrrh, and it came from this area. It was uh, frankincense and myrrh is it's an incense that you burn, usually through ritual. Uh, the Greeks used it, the Romans used it. It was, um, you know, it was, a, it was a rich commodity. And the Yemenis made, and the ancient South Arabians made uh, a lot of wealth out of uh, transporting, harvesting and transporting this uh, frankincense and myrrh. Another fascinating thing about Yemen is Yemen had its own language. It was a Semitic language, just like Arabic is a Semitic language, like Hebrew is a Semitic language, but it was very much different than the Arabic that's spoken today. They had their own dialect. And that gets me to another point that I think it's important to understand about the Middle East because you have so many people here at Moraine that come from different places in the Middle East. And you'll notice that many have their own dialect. In fact, most Palestinians have a very difficult time understanding the Yemenis when they're speaking in Yemeni. And the reason that is, is because in each of these areas, there was an underlying language that existed before Arabic came. It's no different for Yemen, who had this old South Arabian uh, dialect or language that when Arabic came, they adopted a lot of the Arabic, of course, but the accent, the dialect, merged with this ancient South Arabian. It's true in the north with, um, with uh, Jordanians and, and Syrians and Iraqis who had Aramaic that existed before Arabic came on. That's why they have 
that dialect. And so you know, it's kind of interesting if you study languages. Why, why do people speak a certain way? And this will kind of give you some enlightenment um, as far as the Middle East. And also what was interesting is that the Yemenis, the South Arabians, developed their own alphabet. And it's seen here on this. They had different kind of incantations of this, of this alphabet. But one inter interesting thing is that there was a lot of uh, trade, a lot of contact across the Red Sea, in particular with Ethiopia. And to this very day, this is a note, uh, a banknote of Ethiopia. It's called the Giz script, but it's taken from the ancient Yemeni uh, script, and it's still in existence today because of this cross-cultural trade. Interesting also is I've watched a couple videos on YouTube of Yemenis who do DNA tests. And usually somewhere between 9% and about 14% of their DNA comes from Ethiopia because of this trade that has existed for thousands and thousands of years. So I always found that interesting. Uh, Yemen also, or the South Arabians also had their own pantheon of gods, which is uh, very common, not just in Yemen, but throughout the Arabian Peninsula, throughout the world, really. And so they had sun gods and moon gods and of wisdom, and they had, you know, uh, different types of uh, um, art that they would uh, manifest that, these gods in. Um, and then right on the kind of, be, the, right before Islam came, the largest religion in Yemen was Judaism. Most of, most of Yemenis, the majority of Yemenis, were Jews at the time that, um, when Islam came um, to, to Yemen, to uh, South Arabia. So I put a couple other quotes in here that come from um, Hadith as well. Um, this one, Yemen was known by the prophet as Baladan Daiba. Is that right? Daiba which means a pure godly land or goodly land. Um, the best men are the people of Yemen. Faith, faith is Yemeni and I am Yemeni. This is the prophet, peace be upon him, talking or writing or someone writing for him. Many of the tribes who will enter paradise on the day of judgment will be the Mahadiji or the, the Madhiji and the Hadramati tribes. These are both of Yemen. And so this comes from uh, the Hadith. So, one thing that's kind of misconstrued a lot of times in, in the history is that there's this belief that Islam came to Yemen and all the Yemenis said, okay, I'm going to convert to Islam, and then Yemen became Islamic over a very short amount of time. And that's not the case. Yemenis, as everybody knows, can be somewhat stubborn, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's the truth. And it's not any different when a new, an entity from outside of Yemen comes. So this took centuries for Yemen to go from not having Islam at all to becoming um, a largely Islamic people. Um, to kind of prove this point, um, when, you know, when the uh, Yemenis began to convert to Islam in, in, in you know, significant numbers, um, when the prophet died, um, there was actually a movement, that, like an uprising that existed in Yemen where some of those who had converted to Islam decided that since the prophet is dead, they would kind of turn to a different person. And this was called the Ritta Wars or the apost apostasy wars. These were people who had converted and then decided that they didn't want to be. Uh, and so they, they had to be put down. And so even when um, Shia Islam came to Yemen. There were lots of Yemenis who were still worshiping like the old gods. So this, t this took a, a long period of time. Um, when Islam began to move kind of north and began to take over areas of North Africa and uh, Levant, like in Iraq, all the way to Iran, even into uh, India to some degree, the Yemenis, a lot of Yemenis left Yemen and joined forces uh, with these, um, these Islamic uh, troops that were moving into these different areas. And there was a brain drain in Yemen because a lot of the Yemenis that left would go on and settle in North Africa and other places. So, yes, it was good for Islam, but it was not particularly good for Yemen because some of the best people are leaving. And this is kind of a a trend that I, I'm going to talk about because this, is, this, ha this happens over time in Yemen where some of the best and the brightest leave the country and what, what Yemen is left with is not that, right? There, there is a vacancy, a void in Yemen of, of you know, the best and the brightest um, not being there, which really needs to happen for Yemen to, to improve. 
Um, and as I mentioned, in the ninth century, Yemen changes again as there's an a, a, a area in the north that converts to, um, to Shia Islam. They're called Zaydis that kind of forms a split in Yemen between the north, which is Shia Islam, and the south, which is Sunni Islam. And for by and large, for much of the country, this, or for much of the period of time, this wasn't a huge issue because the Zaydis, especially in regards to judicial matters and things like that, were very, very close to the Sunnis. So there wasn't a whole lot of conflict between the groups because of that. There were some cultural differences, but that's largely because of the difference in the far north and the other parts of Yemen, which we'll, we'll talk about. Another interesting aspect when we're talking about mobility in Yemen was how Yemenis, um, particularly in the Hydramaut, would spread throughout the Indian Ocean and um, convert and trade with people further east, whether it would be in, in India or in Southeast Asia. There was this concept called the Alawi way. The Alawi, uh, this notion that were largely Sufis, they kind of practiced this Sufi mystical um, Islam, if you will. Um, they began to move across the Indian Ocean and with them they would take um, kind of prophetize and they would go to uh, areas in India, they would go to Southeast Asia, and within these trade networks that existed um, prior to the coming of the Europeans, that they would spread Islam. So um, does anybody know what's the largest Islamic country in the world? Indonesia. Well, uh, the religion in Indonesia came from the Hyderabad. They were prophetizing in that area, and so, Yemen has this like long history, right, of um, you know doing amazing things. Um, one of the I have a couple books here that I want to share with you real quick, and if you get a chance, and I, if you contact me or whatever, I can give you that. Both of these have to do with this period. The The Graves of Tarim is one of my favorite books of any any book out there, and it talks about the Alawi way and how. Yemenis traveled all the way uh, to across the Indian Ocean and settled. But what was interesting is that because now they were away from their ancestral home, their ancestral home then became a place of destination where, and generations later, they would want to come back to Yemen where a lot of the saints and others existed to kind of meet, you know, make that connection. It's not a lot different than if you're in the West and you say three generations ago, your ancestors came from Scotland and you know what town they're coming from. You have this desire to go to that town, right? Um, but what they found is that things had changed because they had adopted the culture of Southeast Asia and other things, and so when they came back, that things weren't kind of what they thought that they were going to be. And how many times have we seen that um, throughout history, right? The other book that's outstanding, and it doesn't have to do with Yemen per se, but has a lot to do with uh, the, uh, the trade and, and the networks that existed in the Indian Ocean, is called Before European Hegemony, the world system AD 1250 to 1350. And so many times in American um, history classes in high school and stuff, everything is Eurocentric. Well, this is the opposite of this. This shows you what an amazing culture that existed in the Indian Ocean from Yemen to India to Southeast Asia before the coming of the Europeans and how the Europeans kind of broke this system. And so it's another book that I think it's real important that if you really kind of want to understand the area, understand uh, the role of, of Yemen during this period, it, it's a good book to read. And the reason I have these two maps here is I wanted to show you how much the monsoon winds affected travel, where um, and from December to March, the winds would blow from the east to the west. And so any kind of shipping, this is before you had coal and before you had electricity, you had to follow the winds. So people would follow them, and then they'd have to stay in a location for a while until the winds would change in May and October where they would travel the other way. And so you can imagine what kind of interplay of cultures that existed because of just the simple fact of, of nature, of these winds that had this kind of rhythm to it. And we're talking about a rhythm over the centuries. And so it's another way to kind of understand this, um, this area. Now, I would be remiss if I did not talk about Yemen and coffee. 
And there's a large debate um, about where coffee originated. A lot of people said it originated in Ethiopia, but it was really um, Yemen that brought coffee to the forefront. And it was, I mean, there's, a, there's all kinds of uh, folk tales that are associated with how Yemen, or yeah, how uh, the, the Yemeni discovered coffee where there was a goat out and the goat started eating the coffee beans and started like jumping around crazy. And the guy says, I want some of that. And so he starts eating the, go- uh, the coffee and he, all of a sudden he feels like really alert and he, you know, puts them in water and boils it and all of a sudden he's got this dark brew and then, all right, you have coffee. So there's this whole discussion. But, um, but what we do know is that coffee only grows at certain altitudes in certain places in the world. And at this time, it only grew largely in Ethiopia and in Yemen. And so Yemen kept coffee almost like a trade secret. And they would harvest it in the mountains, and they would bring it down to an area called Mocha. And that's where we have probably heard the, the notion of kind of the, the coffee sometimes referred to as Mocha because of this port city. Michael Morshes is in the audience, and he actually lived in a village, what, south of there? North of, north of Mocha, and, and it's like blazing hot with mosquitoes, and it's just, it's a really kind of inhospitable place. How he lived there for two years, I have no idea. <laughs> I was up in the mountains where it was like California, like 70 degrees year-round. Um, but um, what brought coffee even more to the for, forefront was there, was there were a couple Ottoman incursions into Yemen, um, and the Ottomans obviously had spread throughout, um, you know, a large, vast tract of land. So when they um, got a hold of coffee, they would bring them to Istanbul, and then they would trade, you know, pe- diplomats from France and other places would come, and they would try this beverage, and they're like, we need some of that, right? And it's really interesting if you track the word, uh, the original word in Arabic, and how it makes its way to other languages. So I have it up here. So the Arabic word for coffee is kahwa. And from kahwa, you get to the Turkish, which is cafe. And then you go to the French, which is cafe, which uh, to the Germans, which is cafe, which to English is coffee. And so that's how the word kind of makes its way, almost like the coffee itself made its way to these different places. And I always find, find that uh, fascinating. Um, so as I mentioned, Yemen had a kind of a monopoly on, on the export of coffee. But uh, there was one troublemaking European power, known as the Portuguese, who um, had trouble with the Ottomans. And they, they began to do raids in Yemen. And they actually seized some of the plants that were growing, and, like, took them aboard a ship, and they planted them in their colony in Brazil. And then from there, coffee began to go to different colonial areas throughout um, the world. From some of the famous places, we have Java. You probably sometimes coffee is called Java in the Dutch East Indies. Uh, we have Jamaica, um, which is famous in the Blue Mountains. Uh, we, we have Kenya, which the British brought there. And then we have um, Colombia, which is famous, right, for coffee by the Spanish. And so it really became a connection between coffee and the colonial entities that established themselves in these different areas. And as I mentioned, that there is this tradition in Yemen of isolationism, and it largely t- um, takes its form in the central part of the country that is very, very mountainous. Um, so um, in these areas, particularly in the far north, there is this history of tribalism. And that doesn't mean that tribalism does not exist in the rest of Yemen. It does. In the village that I was in, everything, a lot of things were aligned along family names, and usually the, the last name. But tribes have so much more influence uh, uh, in the north. Um, whenever, like when I was living in my village, whenever there needed to be a decision made, you would go to the sheikh's house, who was kind of the head of the, the town, but also kind of a tribal leader. You would, you would chew got, you would uh, have some dinner, probably dinner then got, and then uh, coffee, and you didn't talk anything until everything was settled, and then you would start talking. So there's a, there's a, there's a very Yemeni way to carry out 
um, decision making. You like Americans would go in there and get to the point, right? You go right and start to business, but it's it's very rude um, in Yemen to, to do it like that. So there were a couple decisions that had to do with me when I was in, in Yemen because I was a foreigner that they had to kind of work through. And so it's kind of like being in the principal's office, right? You go with the sheikh and then they make decisions and then you follow the ruling of the sheikh and then um, you know you kind of go on. Um, and as I mentioned before, despite the fact that there was kind of this Shia-Sunni divide, there was a lot of harmony and, and um, you know, a strong relationship between uh, the two tribes. During times of famine, it was very common for the Shias who were very, they kind of had the military power historically as they do now. They would, they would go down to the south because they needed food. And then when the famine subsided, most of them would go back. But there would be elements of the Shia that would stay in these villages. They would intermarry and intermix. And it was never really a huge thing in Yemen until recently. And we'll talk a little bit about that coming up. Um, so through most of Yemeni's, I would say modern, but I'm talking like ninth century up until the 1960s, Yemeni, Yemen was ruled by an imam. And uh, some people are familiar with an imam of like a, a masjid or a mosque who kind of leads the, um, the you know, sermon or, or whatever. But in Yemen, uh, imam was a political and a, a spiritual leader. And uh, he ruled largely from Sana'a, but there were times where he would move uh, to different places like Taiz and make that uh, capital, which was a little bit further south. And he ruled like a king. And one thing that was kind of true of just about every single imam that came around is that they didn't want to have any outside influence. So they largely tried to keep Yemen, uh, Yemenis from going outside of the country and having um, contact from outside. And so because of that, Yemen has kind of this history, particularly in the center part of the country, of being very isolationist. But this changes in the 1800s, um, these pesky Europeans again. In this case, we're talking about England. Um, they established a colony um, in Aden. And the reason that they established this colony is because before the Suez Canal was built, um, this was a time when um, you know, sail ships, but then coal ships would travel all the right way around the length of Africa, and they needed places that they could put coal aboard their ship. And so Aden became kind of this last, one of the last stops, or one of the stops on the way to Britain's crown jewel of India. And so they, uh, Britain established a colony in, in Aden, and, but what was interesting about that is that the, Brit, the British brought all the trappings, kind of the modern trappings of, of, you know, of the modern world to Aden. And so for the first time, as Yemenis would come down into the colony in Aden, they would see things running water. Eventually, they would see electricity and cars and all of those things, and they would what the outside world was like. And this was going to kind of um, change Yemen, lead to ultimately... And we'll get to that in a second. But what would happen, this is kind of the, the interesting thing, and it answered one of the big questions that I had when I was in Yemen. I, where I was um, in Yemen is just east of Ib. There were lots of um, Yemenis who lived in the United States, in particular in Dearborn, Michigan. And uh, the first time that this happened, it was, I was like in shock, where I would be in my village. It was like a dirt road, and I would be out at the market, and a car would come by, kicking up dust, and a window would roll down, and someone would say, what the hell are you doing here? And it would be a Yemeni, but he had lived his, most of his life in, in Detroit. And he's like, man, you got to come with me. And he'd grab me and throw me in his car, and then we'd go, go whisk off to his house, and I'd be there until past sundown, where we would talk about you know, all his girlfriends that he had in Dearborn. It was just so surreal, right, after being in, in Yemen for, for all of that time. But... Getting back to this, um, um, Aden became attractive to a lot of Yemenis because they needed people to serve aboard their ships. And so they began recruiting uh, Yemenis to so serve on board Yemeni ships. In particular, their job was to um, shovel coal into these big engines. They were called firemen or stokers. And Yemenis were seen by the British as being, despite their kind of small size, they were seen as kind of tough guys. Like they, these guys really do work. And so they were in great demand. 
Um, they're also called Laskers, which is a, uh, it was the same word for these, this type of work, but it, it came from um, India because the Indians were the first ones to do this. And so, um, you know, Yemenis were in close, being close to Aden began to come in there, have jobs in Aden proper, were kind of in coming in contact with Britain and thus the wider world. But in particular, these Yemenis who were serving aboard these ships would go throughout the British Empire. And you can imagine, you're from this small village in Yemen, had never seen anything. Most um, could not read or write because the education was not really prized at this time. And so all of a sudden, you're in different parts of the world and ending up in Britain and maybe settling there for a while. And so this really kind of opened the eyes of a lot of Yemenis to what the um, outside world um, was like. And this ultimately, as I mentioned, answered a question. Why, why were all these Americans uh, in this area where, where I lived? How come they, they kept coming through? And there was actually a British guy that would come visit me, a British Yemeni, who just wanted to practice his English, and he was all proper and had this very kind of British accent. And it, it was all very kind of strange to me because I just couldn't figure out how did they, how does this, all these pieces fit together? Well, through my research, I was actually able to find it out in this very small article in a small paragraph. And Josh, you're probably familiar with this when you're doing historical research. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. That um, the because this area where I lived had the most Yemenis per um, you know, per mile, per acre, whatever you want to call it, that the British understood this, and they would send agents out into this area because they knew, because the population was much denser there, that they could get more people attracted to Aden to, to, to come on board these ships. And so that's, this is one reason, if you look at that area that I kind of have highlighted, this was where the pull was, the pull factor down to Aden and then to um, the rest of the world. And so... The, the trend um, was that the Yemenis serving on board these ships would end up uh, ultimately in British cities where they would stay for a time before they would kind of make the return voyage. Uh, one thing that I kind of failed to mention, I had it on the, on the, um, on the uh, PowerPoint, but I forgot to mention is that um, in the 19th century, they opened up the Suez Canal, which shortened the voyage from England uh, to Aden. But it, it still made Aden very important then because if you follow the Suez Canal, it goes through the Red Sea, and right when you get past the Red Sea, there's Aden. And so it actually made Aden uh, more important. Um, and so if you look at these cities that have anchors by them, South Shields, Hull, Liverpool, Cardiff, these were the places where the Yemenis settled at first. Then a lot of them decided, hey, this isn't so bad. I'm just going to stay here. Um, some of them even married non-Yemenis because there weren't very many women with them, right? These were largely men. It did create um, conflict between the British and the, um, and the Yemeni community. There were all kinds of, uh, there were several uprisings that has existed. There were complaints about taking jobs. And then once the, the coal ships went away, uh, the Yemenis who were living there then needed to find other forms of employment. And a lot of them went and started working in the steel factories and, and worked there in England. And then also, um, there's a tradition of Yemeni starting shops. We all, we're all familiar with that, if you know anything about the Yemeni community. There were also Yemenis that ended up in France. There were um, there's uh, French uh, Yemeni communities. Um, so, yeah. So, it, you know, it's interesting how, you know, as I mentioned, how Yemenis tend to go far and wide as a result of the history. So, Let's finish up a little bit and talk about Yemenis in America. How did Yemenis end up in uh, the United States? Well, there were Yemenis early on who jumped ship, got, you know, from the British ships and ended up kind of here and there in the United States. But what really pulled Yemeni Americans to the United States were the automobile factories. And there's a, there's a tradition of Henry Ford, who was kind of a weird guy, um, but uh, yeah, kind of. Um, but um, he kind of had this idea that his workers should be wholesome. And um, in talking to, I think it was some Turkish uh, individuals, you know, they learned that uh, Muslims don't drink, they're family people, so why don't we start having um, Muslims work in the, in the factories in, in Dearborn in Detroit? And so, obviously, the word got out, um, you know, Yemen also having kind of contact with the, the Ottoman Empire and then, you know, later just, you know, in general. 
And so there becomes a, a number of Yemenis who come to, to Detroit and start working in the automobile factories, and then they're telling their relatives, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're having hundreds and thousands of Yemenis that are coming and in working in, in, uh, on the assembly lines. And one thing that's about the assembly line is, yes, a lot of the Yemenis are coming there. They didn't speak English, and they, mo many didn't read or write, but working on the assembly line, you just need to show them how to do a certain task, and it's repetitive, and you could do it. So you could, you know, you created a living. When I was there in Yemen, it was very interesting because a lot of the, the people that I met who were working in the, in the automobile factories, and then they would take a leave of absence like three or six months and go back to Yemen and hang out. And then they, so they would do this kind of back and forth movement where they never lost contact with the home country of Yemen. It was always a part of them. It's very few of them cut off their ties of Yemen and say, I'm going to be truly American. And that, that kind of um, migration exists to this very day. And we're going to talk about how, here at the end, how this has been, been a challenge now because of, of what's going on in Yemen. Um, some Yemenis, because they had experience working aboard British ships in the shipping, they also came to the Great Lakes and wor worked on board ships along the Great Lakes. And so there was a tradition of that as well. Yemenis settled in Lackawanna and, and Buffalo. Uh, there are plants there. Uh, there's also a large Jewish population, a Yemeni Jewish population that settled there, New York City. Um, and one interesting kind of aspect of Yemenis coming to America, there was a group that ended up going to California and working in the agricultural fields because many Yemenis have experience as farmers. And they kind of merged in with the Hispanic population in California. And for many, most people just thought that they were Mexican or thought that they were Hispanic, even though they didn't have that tradition and they kind of uh, blended in. But to this day, there's a large com uh, Yemeni community in San Francisco as a result of this migration to California. And, but what we're seeing is interesting, and this is true of a lot of uh, immigrant cultures, where at first they might be working in factories and, and not have you know, strong language skills, but uh, after two, three generations, you, they're starting shops, and then the next thing you know, they're going to college, they're becoming pharmacists and doctors, and we're seeing that amongst the Yemeni community. It's, you know, it takes several generations, but we're seeing it. And then we have uh, us here in Chicagoland. And so those um, people who, obviously, I'm speaking to the choir when I'm talking to the Yemeni community here. But um, for the last 20 years or so, you could probably go back even further than that. There's been Yemeni settled here in, um, in the Chicago area. And most of them come from these two areas right here, Yaffa here and Dala here. Most Yemenis descend from this area, which is fairly close to Aden, right? Um, one of my interests is to find out how, why, why did the Yafis and, and Dalis, how, how come they ended up here in Chicago? So that's going to be kind of what I'm going to be um, looking into um, going forward. I just find that super interesting that why not other parts of Yemen? So um, that's always an in intrigue to me. Well, as you guys know, and I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to belabor this point, but there's a conflict going on right now in, in Yemen, um, and it erupted kind of in the wake of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was not particularly good for a lot of Arab countries because what kind of came on the backside of the uh, Arab Spring has not been particularly good, whether you look in Syria, whether you look in Yemen, whether you look in Egypt, um, you know, it's, there's, there's just not a lot of great things to say about its outcome, even though it was a democratic movement and those that, that started the Arab Spring had great intentions, those that led this really didn't have a huge say in what happened in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. And Yemen was no different, where they got rid of their longtime uh, president who, um, was not particularly liked in certain parts of the country, but they were quickly replaced by a group of um, really kind of militant northerners who came in and took over the capital and then tried to take over the entire country. And um, the United Arab Emirates and the Saudis prevented the, the Shia group from taking over the south. Um, and the Houthis, the ones that took over uh, in Yemen, they weren't particular, they're not particularly liked in Yemen, but what's not liked even more is um, having aggressors uh, outside of the country trying to make an impact on Yemen. So, but the reason that I want to bring this up is that what this has done is it's in many ways have prevented Yemenis to have this, this natural uh, flow 
from Yemen uh, back and forth. Now, in, if you're in the south, it's much easier to get there, but conditions aren't particularly great. So uh, I think it'd be safe to say that that movement that existed before the conflict has definitely at least slowed down even in the south. And what does that mean? It means that the communities are more kind of um, not, I wouldn't say isolated in the United States, but they are, um, are having less contact with the ancestral homeland, which creates challenges um, as well as opportunities, as we're seeing lots of saying, okay, my home is here, and we're going to make the best of what we have here. And so, um, you know, you see a lot of that. And so, you know, I'll kind of close here before I take some questions, that it's been 33 years since I last um, was in Yemen, and, you know, it's, it's been kind of a lifelong goal for me to learn as much as I can about Yemen. Um, and I, through my studies, contacting people, I have met so many amazing Yemeni Americans um, in the last 33 years here. And I've always wanted to go back, but because of conflict and other things, um, it's been nearly impossible. And with all the friends that I have now, some of them sitting in the audience, if I went back to Yemen, it would actually be a better experience perhaps than when I lived there because now I know families and I know lots of people where before I kind of went as kind of a, a, you know, a lone agent in a lot of ways um, as a member of the Peace Corps. So, you know, a lot of Yemenis tell me, you know, the Yemen that you knew no longer exists because of the conflict. But in my mind, I always like to think about the Yemen that I knew and that, um, you know, through its vibrant history, you know, I can kind of make some of it make sense. And then maybe one day when things calm down that I can return. And I just want to leave you one last thing. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, a gentleman that lived in my village here on the left, his name is uh, Mohammed El Dais. Um, I chewed got with him in my village and hung out with him. And when I, met, when I was working on my thesis, I had asked a, friend, a, a new friend of mine, uh, Rashid al -Nazili, um, you know, would it be okay if I did some research and talked to you or whatever? And he didn't know who I was. And so he went and talked to his friend. And his friend happened to be Muhammad El Dice. And he says, you mean Esteb Kip? And he's like, yeah, you know him? Yeah, he was in my village. What was crazy about that, we, uh, we had met um, when I went and did my research and stuff, and that's him today on the right. Um, and when I went back, I took lots and lots of pictures when I was in Yemen, and I was flipping through my slides. And I couldn't quite put all the pieces together with Muhammad, but I was going through, and I found this slide, and it was of Muhammad and his daughter after all this time. So I blew this picture up, and I gave it to him as a gift. Um, he lives in um, Dearborn now. Actually, I think he lives in, in the southern part of the United States now. But um, it's such a cool story about how your history comes back and kind of helps frame the present. And we're friends to this day. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Like I said, I'll stick around. Uh, anybody have any questions? I think there's a microphone. Um, Please ask me any questions that you have. Yeah. If you're interested in researching about the um, why the people from Yafa and Bala are here, mm -hmm. um, most of the first people that had originally came uh, have already passed away. Mm -hmm. and there's only one man left. I'm going to give you his name. <laughs> and you need to contact him because he's very up there in age. Uh -huh. um, I, I can get his phone number from his daughter. That'd be great. Yeah, and I, you should work on it as soon as awesome. possible. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it sounds important, imperative, right? Thank you. Yeah. Any questions about Yemen, about the history, about my experience? Happy to answer any of those questions. Don't be shy. Well, I, I, if nobody else has a question, I've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, so let's see. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm as someone who you know knows very little about uh, the history of Yemen, and and someone who you know my focus is is primarily uh, U.S. history, and you know in the early 20th century and sure. sort of that kind of thing. You know, the thing that struck me about your presentation, which I guess this is more of a, a comment, is just the um, 
the globalized interconnectedness that funnels through and around Yemen, you know, mm -hmm. which I think is a a fascinating, you know, reality that that more individuals, uh, you know, it, it's it's good for folks to to know about it, as you point out. Um, I guess the question that I might have would be, um, you know, th for those who are are interested in you know engaging beyond their own communities. Um, you know, the Peace Corps, you know, kind of as, you know, for you was, was a gateway uh, to, to be able to, to do that. Um, would you say that's, you know, still a, a, a gateway for folks if they're, they're wanting to engage in that way? Or, you know, I'm sure there's also other ways for folks to do it too. You know, there's lots of ways. Right. Um, maybe, you know, your thoughts on that or other ways for folks to, you know, get involved either in Yemen or in other parts of the, of the world. Right. No, I think it's a good point. And I think that, like I said, I came from pretty much a very somewhat closed uh, society suburb um, in Missouri. And Yemen opened up my eyes. But also, you know, I learned a language when I was in Yemen. I learned about a new culture. And it really, I think that anybody who's traveled a lot or has experiences in two places, which I'm sure a lot of people in our audience do, that you start to kind of meet people where they are. You start to see people where they are. You don't start building a stereotype first and then come into that a discussion or come into that contact with those stereotypes. You Once you've been in a couple places and you lived in places, you kind of drop all of those things and you meet people where they are and it makes you much more comfortable and it makes you much more kind of accommodating and, and uh, you know, someone that, you know, especially if you're, if you're um, you know, curious as I have always been my entire life, the Yemen was an amazing experience for someone who's curious and it's kind of, it, it just, it's, you know, it's like, curiosity on steroids because every every situation is new and you know a lot of the challenges are new and, it, and you have all these obstacles and so um, you know that obviously the Peace Corps is a good it helps build a good foundation um, to do that but you know in general I would say travel widely you know if you have the opportunity put a backpack on your back and get a ticket without any hotel rooms and just go right and it's to kind of experience it so um, you know, I think that that's the, the best way to learn. Yeah. You're welcome. Food in Yemen. Okay, yeah. So food was very different in Yemen. Um, there, um, I don't know how best to describe food for someone who hasn't been there, but, um, you know, obviously there's chicken and rice and things like that, uh, but there's some very distinct uh, Yemeni dishes, and it's different, as I understand, in the north than in the south. I was kind of in the middle part of the country that had more probably connections to the north than it did to the south, and so they have a stew that, I've, as I understand, has its kind of origins with the Ottomans called salta, and that they would have this fenugreek uh, thing that they would whip up and they would put on the top, and there's some Yemenis that don't like it. It's called helba. And it's got kind of a tangy taste to it. And some people don't like, even Yemenis don't like it. I love it. Like, I, I like demand it. Um, they, they also have a, a kind of a peasant, I would call it a peasant dish, which is called a seat. And it's made from um, like wheat that has kind of the consistency, I would say, of mashed potatoes. Got a great story when I was in Dearborn uh, doing my research. And I met my, these friends for the first time. They brought out a plate of a seat. They brought all these Yemeni food, which I hadn't had for quite some time. And um, they bring it out. And so traditionally in the village, the way we would eat it is they'd put this plate and it was kind of communal. You would take two fingers like that and you would dip it into the seat and you would eat it like this. And everybody would do that. It was the way they did it. So when they ordered this at the restaurant, they put it down and I immediately took my fingers and I like started eating this seat and my Yemeni friends quietly picked up spoons and began eating. The <laughs> so they said, yes, you are a gabili. You are a, a mountain person. <laughs> So I learned my lessons well. But there, there's, you know, there's all kinds of bintasan, which is kind of a dessert that's made with honey. Um, um, there's, oh, there's this, you know, and, and Yemenis make the best fool, of course. We know this, right? Uh, people would, nor, <laughs> that, <laughs> those would be fighting words for some parts of the Middle East about who has the best fool. But they fire, they put this, they have this special, like, high power fire that they use to cook the fool, and they have a special dish that's made of, like, volcanic rock. And after they've cooked it, they set it down, and I'm not joking, that it'll stay hot, like, scalding hot for, like, 10 minutes after they've cooked it. 
And I don't know, I kind of like having the top of my mouth burnt off by, by fool beans. Yes, sir? Fool, oh, I'm sorry, fool or beans. It's just basically fava beans that are cooked and smashed up with a bunch of spices and um, other vegetables. It's outstanding, right? Um, if you ever get a chance, I think there's a couple of Yemeni restaurants around. Get, yeah, have, try, go, go there and have some fool. It's a, uh, just say, give me, the, give me the beans. There's fasulia and there's fool. And I prefer fool over fasulia, but I'll eat fasulia, which are, they keep the bean more intact in fasulia, right? So how do I do? Food? Okay, great. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Don't be shy. It's the only opportunity you get. Just outside, I didn't live in the city. I lived in a village about 45 minutes by four-wheel drive to the east of Ib. Yep. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so I worked as a volunteer. So we got about $300 a month. That's how much we got. And this was back in the 1980s. And Yemen was not a cheap place to live at the time. Um, you know, things were relatively expensive compared to other um, places that the Peace Corps was. Uh, and I wanted to save money because after I got done, I wanted to travel, which I did. Um, so I probably stayed, I probably was the poorest person in Yemen. I stayed uh, for $60 a month, it was my rent, with, which included water. Um, I, had, there were, I had a, two rooms that when I first moved in there, it was covered by this much of dirt. So I had to take a shovel and shovel all the dirt out and then blow, you know, sweep it all out. And uh, I had a toilet that was outside and there was a hole. That was basically it. And I would take baths by uh, putting water in a bucket and pouring them over my head. So that was basically my existence in, in Yemen. So to answer your question, it was pretty rugged, but uh, you know, I, I kind of dug it. You know, I kind of dug it. You didn't have to take a shower every day. You know, most Yemenis did not shower frequently. And so I could, you know, I, I kind of got in, you know, not that I was like, you know, stinky, because I was a teacher. But, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, hygiene was not quite as imperative as it is here. No, no. So, right. Yeah, I have a famous story where um, the women would wear what was called sharshif, uh, niqab, where they would you only see their eyes. And I was going down a, a, a track going to my school, and there was a, a woman coming for, toward me, obviously all dressed in black. And we got to a point where we both got off the, off the track. Because in my culture, you give way to the woman for the thing, and in their culture, they give way to the men. So it was like a standoff. <laughs> and so, and I'm like in there, and she's like this, you know? So it was really, it was definitely a cultural clash at that moment. But I only taught boys. Um, they were um, seventh graders. I got all this, I, I, I suggested that I teach the seventh grade because this was the first year that they had English instruction. And so I kind of thought, well, I'll give them the dialect right and get them going right. And then after that, they, they were kind of on their own. When I was there, all of the teachers in Yemen were from outside of Yemen. And so, but they were all mostly from Arab countries. So, you know, we had Sudanese teachers, tons of Egyptian teachers. And so that gave me an opportunity also to learn broader about the Middle East from talking to the other teachers about where they're from and their stories. And, and so, you know, again, it kind of led to education. So, yes, sir. So speaking of uh, cultural clashes, mm. as like an outsider, mm. did you ever run into any situations where people were like, not welcoming to you or like hostile or was it very very welcoming there all the time i didn't get a whole lot of hostile i had a couple incidents but from knuckleheads like you you know you'd run in that here um because yemen didn't doesn't especially where i was didn't have a lot of contact with outsiders rarely did, was there a day that didn't go by where someone was trying to convert me to islam they would ask what religion are you? and i would say you know i'm christian or whatever and that that would that didn't settle right with some and so they're like well have you ever thought and then you get in this you know a very polite discussion and it would kind of almost always end well you're going to hell <laughs> and i was like okay <laughs> can we still be friends though so but, you know, so, yeah, you, I'd get that frequently, except for those Yemenis who had been abroad or had, and then, you know, like I had good friends that, you know, accepted me. But, you know, you're going to get, especially in, you know, places in the United States, you're going to get a lot of closed-minded people, and I think you're going to get that everywhere, right? And so I just kind of took that with a grain of salt. So, grain of sand, grain of sand.
Yeah, so crazy that in the last probably, you know, seven years or so, so many of my former students of Yemen have friended me on Facebook. And it's such a cool thing. And they're like, I remember you. And we, you know, talk about the class. And do you remember me? And the problem is I taught 100 kids in a class for two years. And so it was hard to get in. And I have a famous story where at one time these kids in the back were, were being really rowdy. And one of the kids' name was Muhammad. And I told him in Arabic, I scoot Muhammad, which means like quiet, Muhammad. And half the class got quiet. <laughs> So it was hard to kind of memorize and keep that with me, but it's so cool when, when my former students reach out to me years later. I was there 33 years ago and say, you know, I remember you when you, when you taught English in my village, and you know, that brings a lot of warmth to me, and they contacted me, for sure. Well, I see we're at the top of the hour. I just want to thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome. Should I? Would you buy it? <laughs> Do you have this book? Yes. Yeah, help yourself for sure.